the Chief Executive of Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, but I first came to Herefordshire in 1994 to work for Natural England, or English Nature as it was then, and my role at that time was to lead the team, notifying all the rivers in our county. The first one we did was the lug, uh, and then we moved on to the team, and then we did the Y. So I have personally walked along much of the rivers I was involved in uh, notifying the rivers in the first place, uh, and I love them, and I could talk for a long time, so I'm going to keep an eye out for my two-minute warnings. So my brief really was to talk to you... I'm not sure that's... Is, I think I might need that a bit higher. Yep. That's it. Yep, yep, yep. So my brief is to be positive and to talk to you about the River Lug as a living river. And sadly, I feel I have to sort of go back in time to when we actually notified the river uh, in, in 1996. So the first thing I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about why we notified the river and all the things that are in it. Because we talk about things like lampreys and pearl mussels, but you don't see them because they're under the water. So I've got some nice pictures that I'm going to whiz through to show you what it is that we're trying to look after. So uh, the first reason, the, the reason that the River Lug was selected out of all the rivers in the country is it's still a very natural river. It's still got the wiggly bits, it's active, it's got gravel that's moving down the river, it's forming gravel bars, eroding. So we've got nice, nice wiggliness as you can see on this map. Uh, it's, I'm moving, that's not working when I move, is it? Um, and it, because it starts right up in Wales, it goes through several different river types. So in the upper bit, it's like a fast-flowing highland river. As it comes down, it goes down through sandstone and mudstone and, and, and limestones. And eventually it comes to the lowlands where it's a clay river. So it's got four different river types, which is quite important for the site of special scientific interest. So those are, those are the river types. We don't, you don't need to read those, but there are four of them. So I'm just going to do a few pictures sort of down the river to give you a flavour. I'm sure you all know the river, but just to give you some nice pictures of the river. And of course, one of the things about the River Lug is it's still being a natural river. It's very much uh, it's still connected to its floodplain and it still floods. Uh, and this is a nice picture of it in flood. And I think one of the things that we effectively made a mistake, I think, in Natural England and in the statutory agencies is we thought when we were looking after the rivers and notifying them, we just thought of them as the river. And we did the river channel. And actually, for our rivers, we did the river channel plus 10 metres because we thought that would give us some locus to talk to the farmers about what, how they were managing their land adjacent to the rivers. But in actual fact, you have to look at the whole thing as a living system. A river is the whole catchment, and it's certainly the whole floodplain. And so just protecting the SSSI along the course of the river really didn't do the job, I'm afraid. I'm trying to be positive, but it's difficult. So I thought you'd like to see some of the things that the river is notified for. So this is the, the river, the, the water crow foot, um, which apparently you can now see in Lempster, which is fantastic news. Um, it's one of the things that suffers from the, the pollution. Also, it gets washed out in the heavy floods. Uh, then we've got the lampreys, which are a very elusive fish, very strange, very primitive fish. Uh, so this one is a brook lamprey, uh, and you can see that it's got these gill holes instead of gill flaps like other fish. Uh, and the, the, the brook lamprey has seven of those gill holes. Uh, and the, uh, the river, is that, is that still, a, yep, and then the river lamprey, which is the next size up lamprey, has only six. And these fish are parasitic. They latch onto the other fish in the river, and you can see in the bottom left-hand corner there the little, little teeth that they, they have a sort of sucker disc that they latch onto the fish. So they're reliant on the, on the big fish. Oh, sorry, there's a, that's the... Um, that's the, 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 the sea lamprey, which is the third species of lamprey. You don't see them very often because uh, often they're using the river as nurseries. And so the only time I've actually seen the lamprey, well, twice actually, once was when we were notifying the river and the chap at Mortimer's, uh, Mortimer's Cross Mill said, why haven't you put a brook lamprey on your list? And I said, well, I didn't think we had a brook lamprey. And he said, oh, yes, we do. 
Uh, and at that point, I went on holiday, and he decided to get some brook lamprey out of his brook and send them to me. And by the time I came back two weeks later, I had a brook lamprey soup in a jiffy bag uh, waiting for me, which was not nice. But the other time I've seen them is, is you have to do, when the environment agency, when they do their fish surveys, they do the electrofishing, the little larvae, the young ones come out of the banks. So they're in the silty banks. Another rather enigmatic thing is the, the pearl mussel, the freshwater pearl mussel. This is what it would look like uh, in the river if you, if you and it was there when we first notified it. And I don't think we actually know whether it is still there. That's what it looks like when you take it out. And both the lampreys and the pearl mussels are dependent on the fish because these pearl mussels, the larvae, of the pearl mussels lodge themselves into the gills of the trout and the salmon and that's how they move themselves up and down the river. So obviously we've got fish, the fish are important for the SSSI as well and for the, um, and for the SAC uh, and that's the salmon which everybody knows about. So I just wanted to say a word about the salmon because the salmon was really the sort of keynote species for the site, for the special area of conservation. So the reason that the special area of conservation only goes up to Hampton Weir and doesn't go all the way up is because at the time when we did the notification, Hampton Weir was impassable to salmon. And in fact, at one point, they opened up the weir at some point to do some repairs and found a load of dead fish, dead salmon, actually in one of the boxy parts of the weir. So that was a barrier to the salmon, and that's why the SAC only goes up that far. Now, that's been solved, as have a lot of the other weir problems. And actually, I think that Natural England should be re-examining the designations of this river because really more of it now should be SAC. Uh, this is the white clawed, clay right, sorry, white clawed crayfish, which has been mentioned. So this is a very vulnerable species, and we still do have that on the lug. Uh, and the problems for this is that it, it, it catches this thing called crayfish plague, which comes from the American signal rafe, crayfish, which unfortunately, unfortunately is at loose in the catchment. So that, the problem for that is, is non-native invasive species coming in and taking over and, and causing disease problems. And then, of course, we have otters. How many of you have seen otters? How many have actually seen otters? Oh, that's great. Oh. Great. Good, good, glad. <laughs> so that is the one thing that people can usually see. Um, obviously, there's lots of other wildlife, but those are the things, all the things I've just shown you are the things that are part of the reason why the river was given the protection. There's lots of other things on the river, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Oh, oh sorry, I forgot about the bullhead. The bullhead is a funny little fish that lurks amongst the stones and is also a uh, European protected species. So we've got, we've got lovely, lovely wildlife, and I'm sure you've all seen, you know, there's dippers, banded demoiselles, you name it. So all is not right with the river, we know this, but even when we notified it, we knew that all was not right with the river. And one of the things that I was required to do as the officer in charge of notifying the rivers was to write a, a digest for the powers that be, saying, what are the reasons this river isn't as good condition as it should be? And that's when we started, so back in 1994, started talking about what we then called diffuse agricultural pollution. And we still haven't solved the problem. So you can see this is the condition assessment. You can see all the red there, unfavourable, unfavourable. So, and obviously there are lots of factors that are affecting the unfavourableness. And water pollution is definitely top amongst them, but there are lots of other things. So we've got barriers to fish movement, lots of weirs up and down the river, uh, and the Wynask Foundation have been doing fantastic work getting a lot of those weirs either removed or with having fish passes installed, so that's become less of an issue now. Uh, we've got just general lack of management and neglect, so big trees like the big willows and large alders and things collapsing and falling into the water and pulling the bank out. Uh, we've got quite a lot of problems with grazing and the way that, that the farm, farms were, were managing grazing and allowing the cows to go in the water to drink. Um, and that causes a lot of poaching and damage to the banks. 
and you can see that the soil is washing off those banks and going into the water. So uh, I arrived at the Wildlife Trust in 2014 and thought, right, we need to do something about the river. Uh, and so we started up a river restoration project. Um, and we've been doing quite a lot of work to try and improve things on the river, um, sometimes on our own and sometimes with partners like WOOF and the Environment Agency and, and others. So um, and we've had funding from all sorts of different places. And this project is still going seven years later. Uh, and I'll just show, run through some of the things that we've been doing to try and improve the state of the river. So obviously we've been looking at natural flood management. As I said before, we really have to think of the river as a living thing with a, fl a floodplain and a catchment and we have to look after all of the bits of it. Because every drop of rain that falls in our catchment is going to end up in the river. And all sorts of things happen to that water on its way there. And that's, you know, that's what we have to pay attention to. We can't just fix this in the river. We've got to fix it in the catchment and on the floodplain. Uh, so we've been doing a bit of leaky dam work, which is about holding back water, trapping silt, uh, especially in the headwaters and smaller tributaries. Uh, we've been doing a bit of gravel restoration, so sometimes some of the gravel, the gravel beds, uh, when the silt comes into the water, so I haven't actually said why the silt is so bad. So the phosphate is very bad anyway, because it's a natural fertiliser and it causes all sorts of changes in the way the, 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 the ecosystem of the river works. But the silt is especially bad, because a lot of the things in the water are invertebrates and fish and things with gills that are trying to get oxygen out of the water, and even the water crowfoot is trying to get oxygen out of the water. And if you've got a lot of silt in the water, it clogs up the gills and the pores and, and all the rest of it. So, so we want to, so, uh, and the gravel beds are really important for fish spawning, so we want to try and restore the gravels. Uh, so we've been doing fencing. Uh, we've been putting in boreholes and water troughs so that people don't have to have their cattle at the side. Uh, bank revetment, we've done meadow restoration, uh, and this is some of the stats of the things that we've done on our project. Actually, I haven't updated these, so I think these are two years old now. But the SSSI is still unfavourable, and the thing that really annoys me, sorry, is that this assessment is 2010. Natural England are supposed to re-evaluate the river every six years. This hasn't been updated since 2010. And it's because we all know that the river is failing and they don't want to admit that politically. Um, and these are some of the things we're up against. I'm just going to show some of the really bad things that are happening. This is what we're up against. Um, these are the water quality targets that have just been released. Uh, Natural England have just revised the water quality targets so they're a little bit more stringent, which means that the lug fails even more than it did before. And you can see all the red numbers there, which are the gaps between the target and what we're actually measuring. So I'm trying to be positive, but it's very hard. Uh, you know, the river is not unfavourable recovering. It is unfavourable declining. We've done a lot of work. We and other partners, WOOF, uh, a lot of the landowners that are doing regenerative farming in the catchment, uh, environment age, all sorts of people have been working on this and the river is still going downhill. It would have gone downhill a lot faster if we hadn't been doing that. So, you know, we have made a difference, but it's just still not enough. Um, and the real problem with the phosphate in the river, I think, is the uh, intensive poultry units. So I'm going to hand over to Alison now, who's going to tell us all about them. 